Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. I'm excited to have Lizzie Fook joining us today. So um, Lizzie is an award writing journalist and travel writer. Her assignments have taken her to some of the most remote parts of the planet, from the uninhabited east coast of Greenland in search of roaming polar bears, to the foothills of the Himalayas to track endangered snow leopards. She was inspired to write Moonlight and the Pearler's Daughter, her debut novel, after spending time in northwestern Australia researching the dangerous and fascinating pearl diving industry. And she lives in London. And thanks to Penguin, um, if anyone watching today asks a question, um, they'll have a chance to win a copy of Moonlight and the Pearler's Daughter. Just want to show my copy here so people can <laughs> see the book. Um, so thanks so much for joining us, Lizzie. Would you like to start off by telling us a bit about Moonlight and the Pearler's Daughter? Sure. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, so Moonlight and the Pearler's Daughter is a historical novel set against the backdrop of the dangerous pearl diving industry in 19th century Western Australia. Our protagonist is Eliza Brightwell, a young, strong-willed British woman whose family has sailed across to the remote community of Bannon Bay to set up in the lucrative pearl shell industry. Um, but one day when uh, Eliza's father, the eccentric captain of a pearling lugger, goes missing from his ship under suspicious circumstances, it falls to Eliza to establish the truth of what's actually happened to him. And as she scours the streets of Bannon Bay and eventually the seas beyond, she uncovers uh, corruption, prejudice, blackmail, and lots of long buried secrets. And just wondering, have you got a little bit of the Moonlight and the Pearler's Daughter that you'd like to read to us to give us a taste yeah, of? Sure. That would be great, thanks. Yeah. I'm not going to read from the beginning. I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs from close to the beginning, just to sort of get a flavour of, um, of the book. Yep, sounds great. A pearling lugger can find itself at sea for several long months, its crew returning to shore preserved in the thick layers of salt like dried herrings. Alone on their small wooden boats, facing riptides and swirling currents, it is no surprise bonds are formed out at sea that no incident nor man could ever break. As they toil, lead-weighted boots keep the divers fixed to the ocean floor, along with heavy chest plates and a copper corset worn over the shoulders. Eliza has read newspaper reports detailing men knocked off their boats by the boom, left to sink to their deaths under the weight of all that metal. The tender must take care to fill his diver up slowly, her father would say. Not to do so could leave him agonizingly crippled. Men were pulled up dead, of course they were, crushed out of recognition, stomachs forced into their chest cavities. Others met death with bloated faces, tongues black and swollen, frantic eyes popped clean from their sockets. The white starling has been out for nearly nine weeks now, its men plucking shell from the seabed and stashing it in the holds with the dried fish and curry powder. As Eli Eliza has witnessed many times the men's return from sea, pinched hollow-eyed apparitions drifting list listlessly from their ship, their visible bones just like a collection of piano keys ready to be played. Thanks for reading that. That's a great... Quite um, a dark passage from, yeah. the, from, the, from, the, from the, yeah, the beginning of the book. <laughs> yeah, but a great introduction to the book, though. I, I'm just wondering if you could tell us, how did you get to write about this book and why why did you go to Western Australia and what interested you? So I spent a lot of time out in Australia um, doing lots of sort of long road trips through the East Coast, West Coast. I even drove with my twin, twin sister through the center, completely through the center. And I just love it. But actually this book came to me, there were sort of a few stages of inspiration, but, but the main, the main inspiration struck when I ended up in Broome in, in Northwest, in the Northwest Kimberley. And I just thought Broome was the most beautiful place I had ever mm. been, you know, with its mangroves and its crimson, like bright red uh, pinned and soil um, and it, the sea, just the sort of greeny blue of the sea. I thought it was stunning, but actually it has a, a very dark history to tell and, and its um, relationship to the pearling industry. And I was at, at Willie Creek, Willy Creek Pearls um, in Broome. And uh, my husband and I just went to one of the talks on, on pearl diving and I became absolutely fascinated, not only in just how dangerous this industry mm. was and, you know, the men, men on the bottom of the ocean 
meeting sharks, crocodiles, or whales, and their air pipes would become entangled in the in the whales' flukes, or you know they would they would face the diver's paralysis. So the the danger of this industry really interested me, but also just the fact that in the nineteenth century. Broome is this tiny little sort of red dust township that people from mm. all over the world descended on mm. it, you know, like they did in certain places during the gold rush. And you would just have so many, you know, it was quite anomalous on Australian soil at that time to have so many different types of people in one place at one time. Yeah. Um, and that just absolutely fascinated me. And so the, the research journey sort of started from there and um, it was it was a research process that took place on two continents basically because I was mm. researching here in the UK sort of spending hours in the British Library um, getting my hands on every, you know any sort of book that I could um, about this industry or this part of the world at this at this time um, and then I would be traveling out to Australia whenever I could um, you know trawling through the archives of historical societies or walking the landscapes with guides or interviewing um, crocodile wranglers, naturalists, mm. bu bus drivers, mm. you know, anyone that I could just to get a flavour of um, the pearl diving industry and this part of the world. And it, it was a labour of love. It took a while. Yeah. Um, but I think when you're so fascinated in something, it's not hard to do. You know, you're really, you're really driven. Um, you're really driven on your journey so yeah. yes that's basically how it how it started so you knew nothing about pearl divers at all before no, no nothing yeah. <laughs> you know and i think i think that i think what's really interesting is that you know we can look at pearls and they just feel like it's this very romantic thing and i think on the surface certainly these pearling towns have this veneer of oh you know these beautiful luggers and these sort of male mm -hmm. dashing male adventurers you know just just Put the pearls just fall into their hands but it you know it wasn't that it was an industry built on um in its in its earlier stages forced indigenous labor um indentured labor as well you know it was really it was really a a brutal thing um but yes i had i had I had no idea yeah. and you know the, the the during the research process it was definitely one of those things that proves that truth is stranger than fiction and so much you know so many of the stories that i was uncovering i just couldn't believe that these mm. things happened and so that mm. was that was a really was a really rich theme to sort of plunder and there were so many different interesting anecdotes and stories that i was able to put into the book and so yeah it really made it a joy yeah i'm wondering from what you said as well with your research and everything is there something that maybe you didn't put in the book that um really surprised you that you could tell us oh there was well there was a lot of really really dark stuff yeah. about how um white settlers treated the indigenous mm. and there was mm. lots of stuff that i just it, it was it was too it was too disturbing yeah. and, and too and too graphic um I, I wanted to i wanted to make it very clear that this happened but i didn't want to sort of exploit those stories and mm. i didn't want to present those things in a sensitive way but another interesting thing that i discovered was was basically just how how the hard hat diving helmet actually came to be and actually, its invention is credited to a British guy in Whitstable in about 1820. And he went to um, a neighboring farm where there was a fire in one of the stables and the horses were about to be burnt to death by this fire. Mm -hmm. And he grabbed the helmet from a suit of armor oh, that was yeah. in, in, the, wow. in the hallway, yeah. put it on his head, got a, um, an, a hose that they were using to pump pond mm -hmm. water through stopped the water and told them to pump air through and put that into the art uh, the, oh, the helmet to be able. and went oh. and saved these horses from the fire and he then went on to sell that design to, mm. to a german manufacturer who introduced it on the on the west coast of australia and i just thought you know that's so fascinating that yeah that, that's that sort of the origins of, of where the the top helmet comes mm. from so couldn't fit that in the book but you know an interesting thing <laughs> yeah there was that's so much stuff like that that, yeah. that i came across so yeah and we've got quite a few people watching, which is great. Just um, reminding the people watching that if you do have a question for Lizzie, please type it in comments and I can read it out. And also thanks to Penguin, if you do type a question, um, you'll have a chance to win a copy of Moonlight and the Pearler's Daughter.
So I do have some questions for you. Um, Kelly says that it sounds like a fantastic book. Did you come up with the title and cover design yourself? The title I did come up with myself, um, but actually, well, my twin sister, I've got a twin sister and she helped me come up with the title. We thought, you know, I, I, I was thinking the Pearl is yours, sir, but then I thought I really, I want it to be something, I want there to be something else for the title. Mm -hmm. And Moonlight does refer to, is a book, um, Moonlight does refer to something in the book and it doesn't actually mean the, the moon um but i'll leave that to you <laughs> yeah. to, to to find out what that is um in terms of the cover which i do personally love yeah no, i had nothing i had nothing to do with it um and that's something that uh, that's been interesting sort of on this journey because the book is published in australia but it's also publishing in the uk in march and then in the u.s um, and Canada and other territories and all the covers are completely different which I found oh, okay really have you got any of the how, other covers the different territories I do but I, I'd have to get go and get them oh, okay. <laughs> I'm all, yeah it's interesting to see the different co <laughs> yeah, cultures yeah. ones sometimes um, but I do love this one because I think it's very sort of classically cinematic and I think mm. the gold foil is lovely mm. but yes um and thankfully Penguin did say you know this is what we're thinking do you like it and um Luckily, I did. I did love it. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's just been very interesting to see how it's been interpreted around mm. the world. So I saw mm. the Finnish the, the cover that's going out in Finland the other day, and it's just so completely different. Yeah. Like a, with a bird on a bird on the front with a pearl in its beak. Oh, really? That uh. refers to some parts of the book as well. So it's it's really interesting. I think that's been one of the most exciting things. You know, when you get that email in your inbox and it's with the, cover, the cover of yeah. your book you think oh my gosh I can't believe <laughs> yeah. you know somebody else has taken my words and interpreted it like that it's really lovely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Rosie wonders who your favorite character in the book is and why oh good question um obviously Eliza is our protagonist and I mm -hmm. and I love her and I wanted I read a lot of 19th century adventure fiction um researching this book and let me tell you, that is some macho stuff, you know, it's just full <laughs> yeah. of men um, mm. doing very manly things. Um, and so I did want to put a woman into that sort of environment and see how she would cope. But on that sort of same note, I, I actually think one of my favourite characters to write was Axel, who is the main male character in this book. He's sort of Eliza's love interest in inverted commas. But he is a leading male who has none of the normal qualities of a leading male. Mm. You know, he's not particularly brave. He's not, you know, very dashing. Mm. He's not hugely intelligent. He's slightly eccentric. But I wanted, I wanted to show that you can have a leading male and, and, and someone who readers will hopefully follow through the story and root for, who is not this sort of macho alpha mm. male character. Um, and he's also just, um, Axel is very pure. He's quite a pure, you know, there are <laughs> yeah. lots of lots of characters in this book who are most certainly not pure mm. and, you know, bad people doing mm. bad things. But I just wanted to have a good guy in there as well. Um, so, yeah. So I, I'd say it's probably Axel. Yeah, yeah. And um, Kelly wonders if you're shocked with how great your book has been reviewed. She loves that it's described as 2022 most immersive debut novel. Oh, that's really nice. Um, yes, is is the answer. Mm. And, you know, when you're writing a book, when I was writing this book, my husband and I had moved back into my mum's house during the pandemic when I was doing the, the last stages of sort of editing on this book and getting ready to submit it to agents and, um, and, and see how that went. So it felt like a really insular process. I never thought that anyone would read it. So you never think mm. that anyone is going to review your book. Um, and so when that actually happens, it's a really exposing thing. You feel like you've been sort of cut open and your heart is put on show for everyone to see. And so getting reviews like that just feels like the most gratifying sort of warming thing because you just never thought that this day would come. Yeah. So yeah, I've been really surprised. And as, mm. is, uh, as is an author's way, you know, we're really critical of ourselves. We're really, you know, quite emotional, nervous people. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly am. I can't speak for all authors, obviously. So so when it's well reviewed, it just, you know, completely makes makes my 
I was going to say day, but it doesn't make my month, yeah. my year. So. <laughs> and was Australia the first place it came out in? Yeah. 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 Mm. The Australian, my Australian book deal was the first book, book deal that I got. Okay, um, yeah. So, so that happened before the UK and before the mm. US. Um, and yes, it's the first, this is the first outing for it. So. Yeah. Nice. Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And can you tell us a bit about how hard or easy it was to get this published? And and was it the first book you tried to get published? It, it is the first book I've tried to get published, but I did have a run up. You know, I had a go at writing this book mm. a few years ago and just got absolutely nowhere mm. and quickly realised that was because I had no idea to write how, how to write a book and, and hadn't sort of um, studied the craft of it in any mm. way. I didn't do any writing courses or anything like that. I, I am and um, was a journalist and I thought, oh, you know, I write words all day, every yeah. day, surely I'll be able to write a book. <laughs> Turns out that's not true. Um, so I did, I had a run up and abandoned um, and then uh, sort of a year and a bit later tried again. Um, and then in terms of getting my agent, um, that was, that was, I was really lucky that was quite quick. Um, I think it's, it's a process of luck and timing. I think if your book mm -hmm. lands in the inbox of somebody who's looking for that sort of thing, has the time to read your book mm -hmm. or, you know, it just captures their interest in some way. So the process of getting an agent was, was pretty quick. Um, and I was ab absurdly lucky in that I did have a few agents to, to choose from and ended up going with my amazing powerhouse agent, Madeline Milburn, who's the best. Um, and then we waited, uh, we, we sat, uh, we edited the novel for quite a long time. And then we sat on the novel for quite a long time. So there were a few months between signing with my agent and sending it out to publishers. Um, but then, you know, this is going to make it sound like it's easy and it's not easy. It's, it's <laughs> grueling, yeah. you know, it's really emotionally hard and, you know, doesn't always work out. But, but fortunately, uh, we, the Maddie sold the book quite quickly. Mm. Um, and we had a few publishers interested and it was just one of those instances where, <laughs> you know, they say, you know, like an out of body experience, but it really was a process of sort of, I felt like I was watching something happen that I wasn't fully inhabiting because it was just mm. too surreal and mm. too, uh, you know, it's obviously the brain's way of, a way of dealing with sort of shock and, and, mm. and processing things, but it was, it felt like a very blurry whirlwind. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I was really lucky, and um, yeah, I yeah. ended up here. So. Yeah. <laughs> and Belinda wonders, where was your favourite place in Australia to visit? Oh, great question. I love so many different parts of Australia. I actually love Darwin and the Northern Territory. Um, I love Cape Levick. I just think Cape Levick, um, so about 200 kilometres north of Broome, you have okay. Cape Levick, and it's just stunning. Mm. You know, the, the landscapes there, you know, it's almost like Mars. It's mm. just so mm. bright red. And I stayed at a place called Kuljaman, um, which is an indigenous owned and run um, campsite there. And you, 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 you're in these sort of tents just looking out across the Indian Ocean. And oh, nice. it's just yeah. stunning. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I would say it's um, Gansone Point in Broome, um, where if the tide is right, you can see a dinosaur footprint um, oh. in the reef rock. Oh, and okay. it's just absolutely yeah. incredible. And a few years ago, I spent my 30th birthday about 5 a.m. we went there and the tide was really low and we found these dinosaur footprints mm. and they're you know wow. hundreds of millions of years old mm. and it's just they're, they're not roped off or anything they're just there yeah and yeah it's just mm. incredible mm. and kelly wonders if you're working on a second novel at the moment i am well i am supposed to be working on a second novel <laughs> but it's very hard to um I don't know if other writers find this, but it's very hard to inhabit two different worlds. I, I, I yeah, am. trying to promote. So, a lot um, of authors yeah. have said that to me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have I have written the first draft of, of a second novel, and when I signed um, the contract for my book, it was for two books. Mm, okay. um, a two book a two book deal. Um, so I have written a 
very messy first draft, I would say, because my first drafts tend to be very, very <laughs> messy with lots of holes and lots mm -hmm. of sort of sort this out later or <laughs> make this bit sound good and, and stuff like that. So I do have a first draft, thankfully, but it's, it's proving a, a slower process. But also, you know, when you're writing your first book, there's no expectations or anything. Yeah. Nobody's actually, you know, yeah. nobody's waiting to see it. Mm. It's something that you're doing off your own steam and it's maybe mm -hmm. something you've wanted to do for a long time. When you're writing your second book, there's people waiting for that book and you're yeah. writing it with the constant sort of thought that somebody's going to be reading this and your editors are, are going to be critiquing mm. this. Um, mm. And because I've got editors, you know, from all from around the world, you know, on this book, when I was editing this book, I had editorial notes from a US editor, a UK editor, a Canadian editor, and an Australian editor. Have I said that? Anyway, lots of different editors, you know, giving me feedback on the same thing. And so the, the prospect of going into book two and having that again is... Yeah, <laughs> everyone. Ch yeah. <laughs> so is there anything you can tell us about your book, your new one? Is it historical so, fiction still? It is historical yeah. fiction again. Um, and it does at its centre have um, a very strong woman. Um, I seem drawn to that sort of thing. Um, and so, yes, it's, it, again, it's sort of an adventurous environment with a female character at its centre. Yeah. But um, I would say while Moonlight and Pella's Daughter is very hot and sticky and humid, this second mm. book is very cold and icy. Oh, okay. and so perhaps that <laughs> in a different part of the world. Yeah, yeah, sounds interesting. Could you tell us a little bit about what you like to read yourself and maybe if there's anything you want to recommend to us that you might have read lately? Yeah, sure. I'm actually just looking at my, so I'm in my office and I have piles and piles of books in my mm. office, but there's no sort of, there's no set genre to them. I read so many different genres. So I do read a lot of historical fiction and I love that. But I also read a lot of um, non-fiction and so I'm looking and I've got some true crime books or books about brain surgery, um, <laughs> books about the Arctic, mm -hmm. um, thrillers, uh, contemporary fiction, all sorts of things. And then on my desk here I do have books that I've read lately. So this is a book that I love called Wahala, okay. which, is, which is out in Australia mm -hmm. um, already. I think I think it came out quite recently. Um, and it's it's been described as um, Sex in the City with a Killer Twist. Okay. So obviously that's very very different to my sort of uh, genre, but it's brilliant. It's about um, three British Nigerian friends and what happens to their lives and their friendship when a very glamorous um, woman from their past comes to upend everything with a killer twist. Mm. Um, and then this is this book is called Breathless, um, which is by Amy McCulloch. And that's coming out soon in Australia. I think it's certainly coming out soon here in the UK. And it is about a um, female journalist who goes up um, one of the highest mountains in the world and encounters a serial killer up there. Oh, so it's, really? you know, it's really yeah. thrilling, really yeah. gripping, um, high altitude, high stakes. Um, and so that's, yeah. A couple of books that I've got on my desk here that I really love. Yeah. Um, so I do, I do read anything. I do read all genres, all, mm. all sorts of books. I do have a weakness for strong female leads. Yeah, well, thanks for those recommendations. We always love hearing recommendations. <laughs> um, I'm wondering what you hope readers will love about your book. Um, I hope that they will... I hope mainly that they just find it transportive and mm. um, a bit a bit of escapism um, when we can't have control as far as we would like to at the moment. But I also wanted to write a book about people who were propelled through a story by their grief or by their loss. So for Eliza, she is grieving and she is affected by things that have happened to her in the past but that actually makes her a really active character you know that grief is like rocket fuel to her and it, it propels her through the story and actually there are lots of characters in the book who have suffered loss mm -hmm. um, whether that's loss of family members loss of identity loss of land and mm -hmm. liberty um, but that loss for all these characters 
sends like shoots them off on their way it's a really really propulsive thing and so i hope that i hope that that's something that people can find inspiring mm. in the book and that's that's certainly my experience of grief and loss in, in that it has it has made me i think capable of of striving for things that i perhaps wouldn't have had before mm. so i hope that's interesting but then also i just hope yeah that people find it an entertaining and sort of page turning yeah. read yeah. so you know a big yeah. ask but fingers <laughs> crossed <laughs> And what have you found so far as the most difficult part of your writing process? It's definitely the first draft. It's definitely yeah. just getting, getting words started. down. You know, it yeah. can feel like a real slog at times. Mm. I'm much, my favourite part of the process is when I've got the story in place and ev all the, everything's lining up in the right way and I'm just making it sound good or mm. I'm developing characters or I'm, you know... Um, putting in little clues or you know reverse engineering stuff the hardest thing for me is sort of the tyranny of the blank page and you know trying to just get enough words down um that I've got something to edit yeah. so I do find that a bit of a slog yeah and do you have <laughs> a favorite do. Oh, yeah do you have a favorite place to write so I I am one of those annoying writers who can't write in coffee shops. I mm. wish I could. I wish, <laughs> you know, that'd be so nice and such like a lovely habit to go and sit in a coffee shop and get a coffee and sort of watch the world go by. But I can't. Mm. I need silence and it's mm. so boring. But so I, I do write mostly at my desk um, in London and I'll either have nothing um, on or I will have... Well, actually, when I was writing Moonlight and the Pearl of Daughter, I listened to a lot of film sound film oh, okay. soundtrack yeah um so but sort of orchestral ones mm. um by Hans Zimmer that was that that helped me if I was trying to write a scene with lots of action in it mm. you know had, had the film <laughs> soundtrack on in the background and so that was really helpful or I do listen to um I listen to Green Noise which is um soundtracks of like forest noises oh, or okay. birds yeah. or frogs or insects or something like that. Mm. It, it sort of focuses the brain. So mm. you've got something on there in the background, but it almost sort of zones you in. Um, I can, I can write. I have had to write in sort of other parts of the world while I've been traveling or stuff like that. But if it's up to me, I will be at my desk because that's just, you know, yeah. where I can focus <laughs> and not be disturbed and sort of shut the door to the world. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for chatting to me. Been great talking to you. Just wondering if you want to share with people watching, um, how can they keep in touch with you? Um, so I do have a website, which is www.lizzypook.com, and there's a contact form on there if you do want to get in touch, or um, on Twitter or Instagram. I'm just on at Lizzypook. So please do, you know, connect, get in touch, ask yeah. me anything. Yeah, well, thanks so much. And thanks to everyone who joined in and posted some questions. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.